Peace and grace. Good evening, everyone, on this magnificent and uh, beautiful Monday evening. Uh, Rochelle Wilson chiming in for Make Some Intelligent Noise. I do realize that it is not Thursday, and so, uh, but don't consider this as a premature uh, live video and podcast. I simply have dealt with some things today that I wanted to share with all of you that may be helpful, particularly to my young people, but also to my parents, the adults of young people. Uh, everyone can benefit from this information. So let's, let's just, uh, let's get started. First, before I get into a couple of words that I want to share with you, oh, let me fix the camera. Please forgive me. And I've got this silly microphone here that I'm supposed to hook it into the other end of the phone and, and then so you can hear me, but I, my crew is not here. I'm on my own. They've taught me enough how to go Facebook Live on my own. So this is the best I can do. I hope everyone out there can hear my voice. So I uh, wanted to get started with a brief update on what's going on. Again, today it was 92 degrees with a real feel of 101, which means that people who are being housed in prison facilities across the nation, certain places I know for a fact that those places, the air conditioner is not working. They have limited fans, maybe perhaps one old antiquated fan that's dusty and dirty. Some places are doing a little bit better than that, but I think it's safe to say that most of the prison, most of the prisons in America, um, the, residents are dealing with life-threatening heat conditions. And no, I have not forgotten about it. And no, just because you don't hear me talking about it doesn't mean that I'm not on it. You know, I can't spend all of my time doing Facebook Live and podcasts and Instagrams because I would never get any work done. So this is just a brief update. I'm going to try to do it within the next 15 minutes. I don't have a crew telling me what the time is, so I, I, I have no idea. But what is going on, as I stated, because uh, the returning citizens from the Plumber Center are dealing with life-threatening heat conditions down in the housing units, according to what I've been told, and, uh, you know, when you don't know something for sure, the best thing to do lawfully is to get something on the record. So what I've asked that Brother X to do, which I, I told you I'm calling him Brother X to protect him, uh, I've decided that I'm going to empower this brother. Not only was he the one that came to me, um, well, he actually, let me start at the beginning. Brother Debro Muhammad is the one that reached out to me, called me, told me that there was a situation and a brother that needed to speak with me, uh, that needed to make some intelligent noise and that he was dealing with a concern. I reached out to Brother Debro, met this particular brother, uh, Brother X, and that brother and I then began to engage in conversation of what's going on. And the one thing that I can say I like about him is, uh, well, he calls it marching orders, but I'll say that he can follow instructions very well. And I appreciate that. So I gave him a set of instructions and he actually lived up to it. Here, I have a folder. And inside of this folder is the petition of about at least close to 100 men. You see there their names are, I don't know if you can see, it's a petition of brother's names stating that they are willing to testify in a court of law that the heating condition, that the air conditioning uh, in the plumber center is deplorable and life-threatening. So no, you haven't heard me talking about it, but that's not because I'm not working on it and it's certainly not because I'm senile and I have forgotten. And uh, so just know that this story is not over, no matter what else you hear me doing. Until I find remedy for this, until the air condition is working inside of America's prisons, 
make some intelligent noise movement reporting will not stop. So if you want to shut me up to all of the people in uh, official capacities, you want me to stop talking about the life-threatening heating uh, air condition uh, or lack of air condition into uh, the Department of Corrections, then just offer me remedy. Let me hear from these people that it is better. They have fans. Uh, and that we, we have remedy and recourse, redress. We're allowed to have that. And until you do, I'm not going to shut up. So you want me to be quiet, give me what I'm asking for, and you won't have to worry about me on this particular issue any further. It's really just that simple. You know, I, I mean, I almost want to tell you a story, but I don't want to get too far off task. But I'll say this, there was a woman, a young woman in my life when I was 12 years old, her name was Octavia. She had to be uh, probably 13, but every bit of six foot tall. She had to weigh at minimum 200 pounds. I mean, and that's, that's cutting her a break. So she had very short hair and her complexion was darker than mine. And for some reason that really bothered Octavia. And so every day after school, Octavia would basically beat my ass. <laughs> every day after school, this girl would find me. I mean, I would have to go three and four blocks around the corner just to avoid her. And then one day my mother said to me, she said, baby, you have a choice. You can either get outside and you can go and, you know, fight Octavia, straighten this thing out once and for all. Or you can come into the house where I am and you can fight me. Well, being 12 years old, I didn't have the best, you know, decision making skills, but somehow I intuitively knew that I had a better chance at winning with Octavia than I did with my mother. And so Octavia changed my life because she taught me to have the courage to stand up against the biggest bullies and all of the Goliaths in the world. And anyone who's ever physically met me, you know, I'm really not that big of a woman. I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of short and stocky, but I'm really not a big, big woman. Well, I need to work on my waistline, though. You know, I've been eating too many great meals and cheese and all that nonsense. But anyway, the point is, after fighting Octavia, and yes, she beat my ass again. Um, and she did it very well, I must say but I stood up to her. So it wasn't a matter of her winning or me winning. What was important is that I faced the bully. And since that time of my life, since I was 12 years old, I have never had a problem with facing the bully. Unless you're bigger than Octavia, I'm not afraid of you. It's just that simple. So to the Department of Corrections, I'm coming your way. I'm coming your way so we can have a conversation about the life-threatening heat conditions inside of the Department of Corrections. Uh, so just putting that on the table for now, just on the table, but not forgotten. Uh, the next point that I wanted to bring to your attention, please, was Thursday, you saw that I did a report from the Christina Cultural Arts Center, had a really good time. I sat, I listened, I watched, I paid attention, um, and that's the thing about me. You know, you can think I'm just the dumbest person in the room because I allow you to think that, but um, I'm not always the stupidest person in the room. So that's fine. But anyway, there was a program put on by uh, the good brother, Granville Sadiq Brown, as well as uh, Corey Priest. So they put together something called What's Next. It was a community forum where we talked about returning citizens into the community. How do we empower them? How do we help them? What do we do as a community to reacclimate them into the family, into jobs, into the social norms of what's going on? And um, it was a really good forum. It was a great platform, and I learned a lot. Uh, particularly from the brother from the DHSS, Department of Human Social Services, which, uh, pardon me, I just have escaped, his name has just escaped me. 
But that brother spoke of a program that's in place for our returning citizens where they can acquire their CDLs and get jobs right away. So I think that's a very positive move forward and I'm totally supporting that. Some of you may have also heard uh, House Representative Mimi Brown sort of got her to the microphone and before she made her statement, she looked over and delegated pointing to me uh, that we would now be doing a reentry support group for the families, the loved ones of reentering citizens, as well as the reentry reentry community itself. And I am absolutely delighted about that. I am so ecstatic. I have so many creative ideas going on in my head. I've already started to make some phone calls and begin to engage certain people. And I may even have some help. Hallelujah, that might be great. A young lady uh, by the name of Miss Tickle said that she would help me. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm excited about doing the support group and I'm so honored and so humble that I was selected for this. Uh, it's not a conversation that, you know, House Representative Mimi Brown and I haven't had before and brought to the forefront, but the actual push down, get down, let's get to it is now here. So in the next couple of weeks, if not sooner, you will see that I am making a call out. Get ready now, prepare yourself to hear that call and to answer that call. If you are the loved one of a returning citizen, if you are a returning citizen, then I need you to reach out and become a part of this support group. And I assure you, as many people that have done it before, it has never been done by me. I do it my way, everyone else does it their way, but uh, I'm pretty big at, um, you know, I like doing a good job, especially when people delegate me to do the work. That's something that I have learned over the years. You know, when I was a child, I thought as a child, but now as a grown woman, I use my wisdom as my strength. So having said that, uh, look forward to that. Please, 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 I'm asking you, I'm begging you, uh, share my videos. You must get the word out. I have knowledge to share. You must share my video every time. Even if I forget to ask you, I'm secretly in my heart, I'm sending you energy. Share, share, share. So that leads me to the next piece of information, which is really, really critical. And I'm asking that you grab a piece of paper and a pencil for those of you that were smart enough to go out and follow instructions and you have your Black's Law Dictionary, then I'll need you to go and look up these words. And you can Google them. You know, I am, I am acquiring my master's degree from the University of YouTube and I'm looking for a PhD from Google University. So I have no problem with you Google or YouTubing, that's fine, that's wonderful, but I assure you, you need a Black's Law Dictionary. So, I wanted to take you to the word contract. The reason that I'm taking you to the word contract is because so often, when we are standing in the courtroom, oftentimes on the dock, right in front of the judge, um, there's many questions that are being asked and the backdoor conversations have already been had between the your defense attorney and the prosecuting attorney. They've already made a con had a conversation. But there's this little thing that takes place in the courtroom that can be life changing. It's called a plea agreement. In some states they call it a plea bargain. The reason I want to talk about plea agreement plea bargain is because of those two words, bargain and agreement. When you see those words in the law, you are talking about a contract. A contract, an agreement between two or more parties is a contract. If uh, I, you hire me to cut your grass and you promise to pay me $20 to cut your grass and we shake hands on it, we now have a contract that I will cut your grass and you will then pay me $20.
In a court of law, <clears throat> excuse me, in a court of law, the defense attorney will have a conversation with the defendant, which is another language that I don't have time to go into. They will have a conversation. After that conversation, the defense attorney then goes and has a conversation with the prosecuting attorney. They are making an agreement that they will only put on the defendant X amount of years that they have to serve in jail, in prison. Let me stop there to tell you the exact language. Before we go any further, let me tell you this. So you have, let's just say me. You have me, I've committed some kind of terrible offense. Uh, let's say I have uh, murdered someone. I, I murdered someone. So I kill this person and now I'm in court and my defense attorney talks to the prosecution and based on the circumstances, the situation and everything that's going on, they agree that they're only going to give me five years for murdering someone. This is all hypothetical. This is not law. This is, I'm trying to show you what I'm saying. This is for the young people. You know, the adults, you may understand what I'm saying, but I do have young people who are watching. So for them, I have to speak to them in a way that they will comprehend it. So they decide to give me five years for committing this, this, this act, this terrible crime that I've committed. And I say, okay, I'll take the five years versus say 30 years which may be or may not be the amount of time that you get for murder. I don't know. I haven't looked it up. So now they take, well, the defense attorney takes my agreement that's been made with the prosecution, the defense, we're all in agreement that I'm going to do five years for this crime instead of 30 years. We sign the agreement. I put my signature on it and immediately it goes before the judge the judge has a series of questions to ask me. Miss Wilson, did you agree to this under stress and duress? Yes or no? I will answer the question. Did you, uh, what did you, anyone promise you anything uh, by signing this agreement? Yes or no? Typically, I'm supposed to say no one offered me anything, no one made any promises, just kind of blindly go along with the agreement. And then the judge, in 95% of the cases, well, maybe not 95, let's say 90% of the cases, the judge will agree with prosecution and defense and myself. Okay, so it's 30 years, but you agreed to just do five, and for all of these mitigating circumstances, we're just going to give you five years. Well, hip, hip, hooray, I go to prison for five years, and then I get to come home. But sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes everyone down here, prosecution and defense and myself, we're all in agreement that five years is better than 30. And hell yeah, I'm going to take that agreement. You're offering me five years instead of 30? Yes. Yes. I'll take the agreement. I'll take the contract. I'll do it. I'll do five years instead of 30 years. What I have failed to realize in my emotional content, fear, anxiety, worry, and God only knows what else, especially if I have mental concerns or if I'm on drugs or anything like that, alcohol or whatever. I may not be thinking clearly, but five years sounds better than 30, so hip, hip, hooray, I'm going to take it. The thing is that when you get in front of the judge, the judge has something, this little word called discretion. Discretion. The judge can say, I accept the contract, the agreement that you're guilty, you committed this awful offense, you have pleaded guilty to it, you said you did it, you're taking full admission, and I accept that from you. However, however, and that, those words, however, can be life-changing words. In that very moment, me personally, I'd probably be peeing in my pants. And some people actually do. Because the judge can say, 
I'll take the guilty plea, but I will not adhere to the contract. Instead of giving you five years, because of whatever reason I don't like the color pink, you're wearing pink today and I don't like pink, or today is Tuesday and I don't like Tuesday because my wife never talks to me on Tuesday, or today is Friday and I've got a lunch engagement and I'm hungry and so I'm just feeling irritable, whatever reason the judge can come up with, he can say, I'll take your guilty, but you're not getting five years you're getting 20, maybe not 30, but you're getting 20 years. That can be life altering. That can be heartbreaking. Not only to the person who is standing on the dock because he's just been sold out. He's just been sold out and he's going into the prison system and he has a bond a bond on his head, a bond, a security instrument, a bond that says he has to, is obligated to pay that. And I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole because that's a whole nother conversation. All I can tell you is that he is standing on the dock. He is shadow property. He has now become a ward of the state. He stood on the dock, made an admission of guilt. Yes, I did this terrible, horrible crime, and yes, I'm going to take full accountability for it. Yes, I am making an agreement, a contract with you that I promise to pay. Usually, the payment is not money from the defendant's pocket. It is his life energy, his currency, his current, his life energy is his current. Your current is your currency your currency, your trade. So now this person is standing on the dock. The judge just gave him 20 years because he agreed to do that. He made a promise with the judge under the contract stating that I promise to pay. I promise to pay. That's what they just did. And now he is going to pay with his natural life currency his whole aura and ori inside of the prison for the next 20, 15, whatever amount of years. So it's ugly. It's money. Paper notes, promissory notes, bonds. And again, I don't have time to go into all of that. I simply pray that I am wetting your whistle, encouraging you to pick up your, your book, your Black's Law, and start researching this information. But if anything, I'm here to tell you, never, 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 ever in your whole life should you promise to pay with your currency, your life energy, your ori. You should never go into a courtroom Sign a paper with your signature, which is a sealed blood uh, signature. You're signing it in blue ink. Blue is the color of blood. It's only red after the air hits it. The blood in your veins is blue. So when you sign that contract in blue ink, or well, any color at this point, but it particularly most often they give you a blue writing ink pen. When you sign it, you're signing it in your blood, your ori, your currency, and promising to pay with your very life. Don't do it. Do not take a plea agreement, a plea bargain, a contract with the courts. And if you do, you better make sure that you have studied the law and you know how to work within the lawful um how what do I want to say? The lawful status. You better know your status. You better know your nationality. And I assure you, you want it on the record. On the record. Because if there's no record, it didn't happen. If it's not on the record, I don't care if you sat in a meeting for 25 hours and talked to somebody about something. It never happened if you didn't put it on the record. And oftentimes, on the record is a piece of paper. But if you notice, many times you see me out and about and making videos. 
Well, that's not because I just want to put my face all over uh, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram or my website. That's not what I'm doing. Yes, I am making these Facebook Lives so that I can empower you with the knowledge and the information, but I'm leaving a trail. Do you understand? I am putting it on the record. Every video that I have made in regards to my movement is on the record. No one can say that I didn't do it or that I wasn't there. It's proof. It's documented on every video that I've ever created since I've been Make Some Intelligent Noise, Criminal Justice and Prison Reform Movement. It's on the record. And if it's not on the record, it's not real. It doesn't exist. It never happened. So put it on the record and stop doing contract, plea agreement, plea deals with the courts. You are currency. You are financial wealth to people who are trading your QCIP, C-U-S-I-P, your QCIP number, internationally on the international stock market and trade. Your body... Your body is physically sitting in a prison somewhere, but yet your, your bond, your bond is being traded all over. Who knows? It could be in China, in Russia, anywhere, Africa, whoever bought it. That's where it is. But you're sitting over at some prison somewhere sitting in America because you are paying the bond with your life energy, your current, your currency. Human beings are the are the highest, strongest force of currency known on the planet. Nothing, nothing living, breathing entity has a higher current, electrical currency than the human being. So there's nothing more valuable than us. That's why murder is such a big charge. So if I go and kill Johnny Boy over there, I've ended his current his electrical current, his body, his energy, his spirit, his soul. I've taken that from him. And as a result of taking his currency, I'm going to pay with mine. It's, it's money. It's, it's wealth building. You have to understand what the courts are really all about. The judge that sits on the bench, if you look up the etymology of the word bench, Etymologically means bank, B-A-N-C. A bank is the Middle Eastern word for bank. The judge sits on the bank, on the bank, the bench, and he determines, well, let's see now. Uh, Johnny Boy here is worth, oh, I don't know. If I put him in jail for five years, uh, he'll be worth, um, you know, $20,000. So uh, that's not really that much, and we can do without it. But over here, we've got uh, Malik and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Shakri and, and Sadidi and uh, all of these other names. We've got these people now. This one here, he's about 25, 26 years old. Uh, he's staying six foot tall. Uh, he's got a nice muscular frame on him. He actually reminds me of something called a Mandingo. The Mandingo is worth $40 million. 40 million in 20 years. So yes, let's get Mandingo, his currency, his electrical currency, his ori, his, his body. Let's get that in the prison for $40 million on an international stock exchange or international markets. Woo! The judge gets a cut of that. Do you understand? The judge gets a piece of that money. He gets a cut. He gets a cut. The state that you're prosecuted in, they get a cut. It's all money. You need to understand this. I don't understand. Like people are signing their lives away when they go into a courtroom and sign a plea agreement. Stop. Stop. You have a lawful right by your constitution. The constitution of the United States says you have a lawful right to be tried to face your accuser and to be tried by a jury of your peers. Are, are the courts going to be pissed off at you that you want to have a jury? Yes. It costs money to find 12 people to sit in the courtroom for weeks and decide whether or not you're innocent or you're guilty. It takes time. The judge's time, the defense attorney, the prosecution, every attorney that passes the bar does not know how to litigate. 
They're not good litigators. They're not good speakers. Most of them want you to do the plea agreement so they don't have to stand up and litigate in front of a judge. Most of them are cowards. They don't even know how to begin to fight, verbally fight. Uh, it's called an argument in law. It's called to argue. So these are the languages that, that people have to understand. But many attorneys in America today would much rather push a piece of paper in front of you, have you sign it in blue ink your blood, saying, yes, you promised to pay this currency of your life for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 50 years. They would prefer to do that than to stand up in front of a judge and actually have to study and litigate, fight for you. But that's what you're paying them thousands of dollars to do is to stand up and fight for you, not to push a piece of paper in front of your face. I tell you, if I had known then what I know now, my life would be different. For those of you that did not go out and get your Black's Law Dictionary, you just, you just hard head or you don't have the money or whatever your excuse is, you know, I'll just say this. Ignorance of the law is not a defense. You cannot stand in front of a judge and say, oh, your honor, I didn't know. Really? Oh, he'll just love that. Just absolutely love that. Oh, we got another dumb, ignorant person here in front of me. So yeah, let's definitely get their currency going. Anyway, for those of you that did not purchase your Black's Law Dictionary, or maybe some of you purchased it and it just hasn't arrived yet, you're waiting on it, it'll be here any day now. Uh, if you just bear with me, I want to share a few words with you, and I'm not sure where my time is. If somebody could please, I see you're chiming in, you're talking to me, I can barely see the, uh, uh, what's that say there? Can somebody tell me how, how long I've been on? Has it been 15 minutes? Anybody out there? Okay. And follow the bouncing ball. A contract, according to Black's Law. A contract is an agreement between two or more persons which creates an obligation, an obligation to do or to not do a particular thing as defined in restaurant. I'm sorry, restatement, second contracts. A contract is a promise or a set of promises for the breach of which the law gives a remedy or the performance of which the law in some way recognizes as a duty. The simple terms, a contract is an agreement between two or more parties of mutual benefit, a promise for two people, two or more people to do something. I promise to cut your grass and in return you promise to pay me $20 to do so. A, it has to be mutual. If I promise to cut your grass, but you make no promise to me to do anything, then that's a one-sided contract. You're getting all the benefit because I'm doing all the work and cutting your grass and I don't get anything out of it. Oh, what? The experience of learning how to cut grass? Give me a break, okay? So if I stand in a courtroom on the dock and I agree with the judge, yes, I will take the plea agreement. I am telling the judge I promise to pay you with my currency 20, 10, 15 years of my life. I promise to pay you. Well, how does that benefit you? You're going to sit in a jail for 10 years while the judge gets money from the International Stock Exchange on your contract. Don't do it. You must ask for a trial by the jury of your peers. And a jury of your peers means people that look like you, people in the same social status as you. For example, most of you who have eyeballs can see that I am a light-skinned, melanated woman. Uh, I'm 56 years old. So what does it look like for me to stand or to sit to have a jury of my peers where a whole, like, 10 people are all male, white males, uh, under the age of 30? 
How's that a jury of my peers? They have no idea of anything about my life. They don't know what it is to be a melanated woman of 56 years. They are not a jury of my peers. No, I need a jury of people that are in the age range. They're between 40 and 60. I need some African Americans or, you know, I'm just using that language for now for the sake of, because I haven't explained to you what the word black and what the word white means. Uh, you can go to this book and you can look up those two words. It doesn't mean what you think it means, people. Black and white does not mean what you think, but for the sake of just keeping it simple, I need to be sitting around some women, and I need some 50-year-old women, and I need some, some, some melanated women, give me some Asian women, some Latin American women, give me some women that look like me around my age. That is a jury of my peers. So if, if, if you've got a 22-year-old boy, and I call him a young man because, you know, I'm old enough, I can call him that. So you've got a 21, 22, 23-year-old boy sitting here, and the jury of his peers is uh, uh, five old 60-year-old white men and four white women. And they're all over the age of 50, 60, 70 years old. And but you've got a 25 year old African American sitting down here. That's not a jury of his peers. That's where you get your lawyer to do the work. Understand this, people. If you're going to pay your attorney thousands of dollars to defend you, please get him to do his job. Let him work. Ask questions. Become engaged in your in, in your case. Learn the law so you can defend yourself. If your attorney is doing all the standing up and speaking, that's wonderful. I love that. I love to see a good litigating attorney. I, I find it interesting. It's like ping pong between the two of them. When you get two really good attorneys who know how to litigate, it's like a ping pong match. It's like, ooh, who's going to win this? And it's good. But far too often in America, we don't get to see that. So if you're going to hire an attorney for thousands of dollars to go and defend you, please make sure he's doing his job. He's answering your phone calls. He's coming to talk with you. He's having meetings with you. He understands the law. And he's not afraid. He's got the courage, uh, uh, the kahungas, as they say in Spanish, the kahungas to get up there, roll up his sleeves and fight for you. Not just push a piece of paper on a plea agreement. Make it work. That's what you paid him for. So let him do his job. And showing him that you know enough about the law to make him do his job, make him accountable. He's an attorney. He says he's your attorney, so make him accountable to be your attorney. Get you a good a, a jury of your peers. They should be similar to you. If you're 25, then your peers are somewhere between 25 and 30. Okay? Uh, if you're African American, then you need at least six people on that jury to be African American. If you're a woman, you need six of them to be women. There's a whole jury selection process that goes along with that. Get involved in your case. Don't sit back and like, oh, I got an attorney. He's going to take care of it. Yeah? Don't make me use language that my young people don't want to hear Miss Rochelle say. Because you know what? You're fooling yourself. You all screwed up in here. You think the attorney's going to do it? Hell no. And God only help you if you get a public defender. If you get a public defender? Really? Oh my God. I really pray for you. Trust me. I'm that fool. I got a public defender for my son. For my son, Justin. I had a public defender. A lesson learned. Lesson well learned. And I'm not saying they're all bad. You got some public defenders out there. I've actually met one. And I want to say his name, but now he's an attorney, so I, I won't say his name. But I met him at the time that he was actually a public defender. And a young white male, I love him to this day. Every time I see him, if I see him at Starbucks or the car, I don't care what I'm doing. When I see this man, I will get up and take off running to him. I just want to say hi. Because he's a human being. And he's not afraid to litigate. And he actually cares. He has compassion in his heart. He wasn't even Justin's attorney. And he stepped up to try to help Justin. He wasn't even his attorney. He's got 80 cases sitting on his desk, but he put in a good word for Justin. 
I mean, you, you just we just need more of those in America. We do. So I'm not saying all the public defenders are, are lazy. I'm not saying that all attorneys that push paperwork are, are cowards and afraid to litigate. I'm not saying that at all. I'm sure there are many attorneys out there who, who enjoy the adrenaline, the, the, the pumped up adrenaline to get up there and litigate, uh, you know, toe for toe with your next attorney. Let's, let's, let's take this to the face. It's ping pong. Who's the best between the two of us? Who's going to win? It's a good challenge. And there are some attorneys in America who will actually do that. They will get up and they will litigate on your behalf. You just have to do your homework and find out which attorneys those are. So, going back to my initial word, a contract is an agreement between two or more parties with a promise to perform a duty or obligation. I am obliged to cut your grass. We shook hands on it. You promised to pay me $20 to cut your grass. You must pay me. Otherwise, and if I if you give me $20 and I don't cut your grass, that is called a breach, breach, B-R-E-A-C-H, a breach of contract. And that's a whole nother law, a whole nother can of worms that I don't have time to get into all of that. Kim, are you out there, honey? Have I passed? Uh, how long have I been up here, Kim? Have I been up here for 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I have no idea. Uh, I wanted to share another important word with you. Please just bear with me. I, I don't want to get too far uh, down the road, although I'm already down the rabbit hole. So here we go. I want you to look up the word collateral estoppel doctrine, a collateral estoppel doctrine. Please look up that word. Get your Black's Law Dictionary and look up the word collateral estoppel doctrine. What does that mean? Sure, I can stand here for another 15 minutes and tell you what it means, but it's, it's better for you to know what it means because you looked it up and you did the research. But it's an important word. It's a very important doctrine. And I want to say this for all of you out there who are serious about learning the law and you really want to protect yourself, you want to protect your loved ones, you must learn the Constitution of the United States and you must learn the United States Constitution. What is the difference between those two doctrines other than the word of? That little word, O-F, of, really takes it to a whole different level. The Constitution of the United States has laws and rights it, it is supported by something called the Magna Carta, the, the Great Charter of 1215, one of the most influential documents that has ever been presented that helped to create the Constitution of the United States. You need to study this. You need to know this. Find out what is the difference between the Constitution of the United States and the United States Constitution. One of them gives you complete natural human rights as a human being, living, breathing, alive, flesh and blood human being. The other one, the other one says that you are chattel property. What is chattel property? C-H-A-T-T-E-L. Not going to tell you. You need to go and find out what it is. So those are your homework assignments. For tonight, for those of you who are serious about learning the law and serious about protecting your family in a courtroom, you want to know what is a collateral estoppel doctrine. You want to know what is the difference between the United States Constitution and the Constitution of the United States, which is supported by the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, also by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship and some other very important treaties and doctrines. Okay? But uh, in closing, because I don't want to take up everyone's time, there's another word here that I want to share with you. Oh, here it is. Here it is. I have it. So, again, I'm reading from my Black's Law. I'm telling you, it's my favorite book in the whole wide world. I love this book, other than, of course, 
the new Jim Crow, which I must be really behind because the book was written 10 years ago, released 10 years ago. And to me, it's like it was just released yesterday. Uh, I guess I'm the only other person in America who hasn't read it yet, but that's okay. Better late than never. I'm reading it now and a wealth of information it is. Okay, so here's another word that I want you to understand, understand this word. Color and appearance a semblance as distinguished from that which is real, a prima facie or appearance, a deceptive appearance. Think about this. Whenever something is whatever it is, and then you put color over top of it, it is not the original thing. It has color on it. So when we go into our court rooms, we are sometimes dealing with something that is illegal and unlawful. It's called colorable law. How long? Oh, 25 minutes. Thanks, Kim. Okay, so I have to close because I've been here 25 minutes. Colorable law is against the law. You cannot treat people a certain kind of way based on colorable law, which means it is deceptive law. It is not organic, original law. It's deceptive. It's got color over it. Now that has nothing to do with the difference between the word white and the word black. White and black do not mean what you think they mean when I say my sister friend Kim is white. Well, in all actuality, when you go and look up the word and the definition, I'm white. I am white. Rochelle Wilson is white. According to the Black's Law Dictionary, I am white because I know my rights. Those of you who don't know your rights, you have no clue whatsoever what your lawful rights are when you step in a courtroom, when a policeman pulls you over. You don't know? Yes, I suppose you are black. And it has nothing to do with the color of your skin. It has everything to do with what's up here in your head. Okay, so Kimmy says I've been here 25 minutes, so I've got to go. Uh, so color is a deceptive appearance. And here, I'll just give you this and I'm closing. Color of law, the appearance or semblance without substantive or legal right. If you were dealing under colorable law, you were dealing without lawful rights. No law, color of law, unlawful. I'm sharing this information with you because someone that I love and that I care about, a dear sister friend, her family has gotten caught up in a situation where a plea agreement and a contract is involved. I, I am a mother who has been down that rabbit hole. My son signed a plea agreement. He made a contract with the courts. He stood on the dock and he made a contract with the courts because his public defender told him that he had to. My apologies, I thought I had turned my phone ringer off. So I'm beyond my time anyway. The bottom line that I'm trying to share with you for all my moms and dads out there, had I known this information, had somebody shared with me what I am now sharing with you, my son would be home and who knows where I would be and all other kinds of things might be different. But they are as they are. Parents, mom and dad, do not take your child if they are under the age of 25, no matter what anyone else says, because our minds haven't fully developed until we're age 25. If you're under the age of 25, you are still developing, you are still learning, you are still growing. Do not take your child into a courtroom and sign a contract with your blue blood, which is red after the air hits you. Do not do it. Signing the contract, signing the contract is just messy. If you've listened to this report that I'm doing here tonight, I hope and pray that I have saved somebody's child, that I have saved some parent out there, some sister friend, some brother, some father. 
You, you know, somebody is listening and they're paying attention and they really are serious about being the best them that they can be. And if you're going to be moving forward with me in my movement, you need to understand that I don't always have time to explain things to you. You got to catch up. Follow the bouncing ball, folks. You know, uh, I, I, I don't want to seem like I'm stupid, but I always tell you I'm not the smartest cookie in the jar. I don't have any titles or names, or, you know, letters behind my name. I don't have any official capacity. I don't work for anyone other than myself. You know, I'm just me. I'm my own boss. I'm my own woman, my own person. And I just, I just want to help somebody. Somebody out there, you have to please, you have to share this message. You have to, you have to share this post. People need to know the truth. And I'm asking you to share all of my posts. If you didn't share the last one I did, go back and share it. And the one before that, go back and share it. I want to reach the entire world. I want everyone to know. Even if I don't ever do anything great and wonderful, I'm leaving a legacy for my grandchildren. So share, 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 share these posts. Share this information. It's on the record. All right? And it might save your life or the life of someone you love. And in closing, as I stated before, I've been honored. I'm so happy, absolutely delighted. I have so many creative ideas going on in my head based on the knowledge that I have. I, I already know exactly what I want to do in order to get this uh, reentry uh, returning citizen support group going for the, for the citizens as well as for their families. I'm just delighted that I've been chosen for this job. And I promise you, uh, I promise myself, because I answer to a higher calling than anything here on earth. And nothing here on earth has a higher calling than the one that I answer to. And I know some people out there want to see me fail. You want to see me fall on my face. You want to see me not do well. And that's fine. You are entitled to have those thoughts and those opinions. I, I ain't mad at you, honey. But... You'll have to take that out with a higher source because the God that I serve has put me on this assignment to do what I'm doing. And I'm going to do it to the very best of my ability. I will remain humble. I will remain uh, intuitive and I will continue to take instruction from that higher power. So if you don't like what I'm doing, take it up with the person that's bigger than you and I and have a conversation with that energy because I'm going to do what I've been put on assignment to do. And in the interim, until our report, our next report, which will be Thursday at seven, please make sure you join me for that. Um, with more information by then, I will have spoken with more people, including House Representative Mimi Brown, to find out her thoughts, her ideologies on what she sees uh, the support group looking like, and if it's in agreement with what I see. So, you know, it's very important to be on the same level uh, with folks when you when you start an endeavor. So as long as she and I are on the same page on how to do this uh, support group, then it's all it's all in. Make sure you share the word with people. Make sure they come out. I will give you a date, a time, a location. When I get things in order, I will let you know, and I'll expect to see you there. Returning citizens and their families. And remember, what's next by Granville Sadiq Brown. And Corey Priest, they're doing it, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to do it once every month. Make sure you show up for, for these community activism uh, reentry programs and, and conversations. We need everybody on deck. We need everybody on deck in order to make this thing work. So I'm Rochelle Wilson. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for another edition of Make Some Intelligent Noise. I hope that I have enlightened you. And I pray that I have done something to help you and save your family. Until our next report, peace and grace. I'm Rochelle Wilson. Ashe.